Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following him on Twitter for a while. Really great insights. He also has a Real Vision television interview that Real Vision just released for free. It's a must-watch. I'll attach a link to it after this interview is over. He's the founder of an artificial intelligence firm, Complete Intelligence. He worked at The Economist, and he's lived and worked in Asia for over a decade. Tony Nash, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jason. Now, Tony, I want to talk about your background for my listeners who are not familiar with your background. You have a pretty unique background. You've lived and worked in Asia for over a decade, and you have extensive experience working in China, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, I lived in Singapore for about 15 years. Um, I did work all around the region from you know, developed country governments like Japan and, and Taiwan to um, you know, building a business in the middle of Sri Lanka's civil war to advising um, China's National Development and Reform Commission on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so, you know, I've been all around the region with, with uh, many, many different perspectives. Do you think that China has changed a lot in the last 10 years? Because I think when I speak to my sources in mainland China that are still there or people like you who work, lived and worked there for a long time and have left, they tell me a lot of them are Americans, but they tell me that they used to be treated friendly, very friendly. They used to be able a lot easier to get business deals done. And over, especially over the last couple of years, things have changed a lot in China. And this was before the Trump tariffs and the trade war accelerating, and that has only exacerbated the problem. So what's your opinion of that? Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, um, since 2012, in 2012, we saw an intensification of uh, Chinese sentiment toward Japan uh, over uh, some geopolitical issues with um, an island dispute. Uh, and we saw uh, uh, protests at Japanese factories and of Japanese companies and uh, a number of Japanese um, uh, expats and companies were made to feel pretty unwelcome. That was kind of a rehearsal for um, what's uh, happening with the U.S. right now in China and, quite frankly, what's happened with, uh, let's say, Canada as well. And so, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward for the Chinese government to turn the dials on, um, on a xenophobic approach um, because they don't want the Chinese people to look uh, to the government for problems. They don't want the government to be blamed for problems. Uh, when in fact, um, you know, the, the, state, cent the centralized state system in China is incredibly problematic right now. Um, and, um, and it's pretty easy to blame the U.S. So, um, so I think focusing on American businesses, focusing on Trump, for example, uh, is an easy way um, for the state to, um, to kind of shy away from accountability for uh, economic slowdown. So you think that Trump has given the Chinese government an easy scapegoat, an easy excuse now that he's put the tariffs on? Because I think there's a lot of evidence if you look at the official Chinese economic data that's been released that the Chinese economy has been getting worse for the last couple of years, and this was before Trump put the tariffs on. But I've, um, from the sources I've spoken to in mainland China and some of the other data I've looked at, it seems that the tariffs have exacerbated the problems, especially with a lot of these Chinese uh, manufacturing and factory owners and made things worse in China's economy. And now we have the warnings from Premier Li. There was another warning from Premier Li on Chinese state-run TV, I think, today in the last couple hours. And then also with Xi and the head of the People's Bank of China, their central bank. Oh, yeah. It's, um, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the spike in uh, banking liabilities and overseas lending. It has a lot to do with the inefficiency um, of state-owned entities and overproduction. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a credit glut. There has been a credit glut in China for quite some time. So, um, you know, the, the problem that we see is, um, you know, manufacturing in China um, as a share of the economy is down uh, 10% since 1980, okay? Now, what's also very interesting is, 
uh, manufacturing in the U.S. as a share of the U.S. economy is also down 10% since 1980. So, um, you know, both countries are, have seen a decline in manufacturing. Um, that's made sense to some extent in the U.S. Um, with, uh, you know, with a lot of the technology-based um, uh, gains in productivity, this sort of thing. China has seen that as well. But China isn't necessarily at a uh, productivity and an economic point to be losing manufacturing jobs in aggregate. Of course, they do on a subnational basis, coastal cities and so on and so forth. It moves westward. Um, but to, um, to rotate out of manufacturing at the same pace as the U.S. In fact, China's manufacturing sector has declined 3% since 2010. Um, and so that's a very rapid um, deindustrialization pace. And wages, correct me if I'm wrong about this, wages in mainland China have gone up around 500% in the last 15 years or so. So China used to be known, the main perception out there was that China was the lowest cost manufacturer. That's where China would make a lot of the cheaper assembly. China wasn't innovating with their manufacturing. They were assembling right at the end stage. So they would bring in, if they were making an iPhone, they would bring in parts from Japan, South Korea, Germany, and the U.S and then it would be assembled in China, right? And now that the wages have risen in China, they're no longer the lowest cost manufacturer. Oh, they're definitely not the lowest con cost manufacturer. And the problem, you know, one of the real problems in terms of manufacturing when you, when you look at China is, um, is uh, Southeast Asia and Mexico, okay? So um, when you look at China's top 10 exports to the U.S., you get things like telecom equipment, computers, um, uh, say televisions, those sorts of things. Mexico is becoming increasingly competitive with those kind of higher end, let's say middle end goods. Part of the reason Mexico is becoming more competitive is because of uh, USMCA. Another reason Mexico is becoming more competitive is the deregulation of electricity rates in Mexico uh, two years ago. Um, as power prices have been deregulated in Mexico, it brings down the cost of manufacturing. And um, power-intensive industries um, uh, are more attracted to Mexico. So when China joined the WTO, um, there was a push factor out of Mexico. It wasn't necessarily just the magnetism of China. It was electricity prices that pushed a lot of these guys out because it was just unaffordable. Um, when you look at other exports that China has, things like um, furniture, chairs, toys, suitcases, these are all in the top 10 exports to the U.S. You know, those things, the, the, the labor uh, portion of those costs and the competitiveness of other parts of Asia um, is so heavy that some of these things just should not be produced in the parts of China where they are now. Um, so places like Vietnam, of course, but also even Bangladesh, the, those places are more competitive because of the labor component of, of uh, some of those manufactured goods than, uh, than China today. So China has been or is being competed out at the top end, and it's also been costed out at the bottom end. So when we look at things like electronics manufacturing, um, uh, some of my friends who are in the electronics manufacturing sector on recent trips to China in November told me that major factories in China, their order books are down 30% year on year. Okay, um, That hurts. And these are not the data that we're seeing in the official PMI figures. They're not the data we're seeing in you know, exports and other things. Uh, but you know, firsthand observational evidence of visiting major electronics factories in China is that these guys are down 30% year on year. Part of that is the tariffs are forcing a rotation out of China. Um, and part of that is just that other countries are becoming more competitive. And so these things are happening really simultaneously. Um, and when you look at when Chinese exports really changed, it was in 2015. So, you know, when we look at the equity market downfall in China and we look at how 
trade changed. A lot of these things really inflected in 2015. It's not necessarily a 2018 phenomenon. Of course, it is, but that's not necessarily when things started. So China's never really recovered from the May-June 2015 equity market uh, fall. Uh, I think equity markets fell, I can't remember, 30% or something like that in the course of a month. Um, and they've never really come back up. And, and it's been problematic for um, investors. It's been problematic for government. It's been problematic for the perception of China since then. And China, during that time period, in, a, in only 12 months, according to China's own data, they also spent over a trillion dollars of their foreign exchange reserves. It dropped from, what, $4 trillion worth of reserves, a massive amount, down to $3 trillion, and it stayed around that right. number officially. And then, according right. to other sources, China, the Chinese banks, the People's Bank of China, went to the massive derivatives, the forward dollar swaps after that, and maybe took out a lot of loans from foreign banks for dollars. But do you think right. the tariffs, do you think the tariffs have hurt Chinese for firms and the Chinese economy more than the American economy and American firms? Oh, yeah, I do, definitely. I think um, if you look at there was, um, there was a piece of uh, work done by Goldman Sachs in Q3 of this year um, showing that Americans absorbed only about 2% of the tariffs. And I think what's missing from a lot of the discussion around um, the trade war is the elasticity and the flexibility of global supply chains. So China doesn't necessarily have those unique and compelling factors that it had, you know, 10 or 15 years ago where you just had to be there. Those just aren't there anymore. And so the substitutionality of um, export locations is relatively new. And if, if you remember, uh, you know, in 2006, 7, 8, um, a lot of global manufacturers were considering a China plus one or China plus two or China plus three strategy because there was a feeling among um, supply chain folks that they were over dependent on China. And then what happened? The, the global financial crisis happened, okay? So um, with the global financial crisis happening, um, a lot of these manufacturers just decided to de-risk and leave everything in place. And rather than kind of um, uh, diversifying, they actually doubled down on China. And so the concentration of their risk grew much, much higher. And the problem that China is seeing now um, is that supply chain heads and, and, uh, and senior executives have realized the amount of risk and the rate of change of that investment or deinvestment is much faster than would have happened, of course, if the supply chains weren't so concentrated in China. So there's a massive requirement uh, for executives to move. Nobody wants to be blamed for having the supply chain, you know, stop up because of, um, of the tariffs or because of a, a, you know, trade disagreement between U.S. and China. Um, so, you know, there's been a very, very rapid movement to other places uh, because of the concentration of activity there. It feels on a nominal basis, it feels like a lot, but on a, let's say, um, on an overall share basis, these are kind of, these started as kind of incremental changes, but it's, it's got, uh, gaining pace. So Samsung just left China completely for all their manufacturing. Mm -hmm. How much of a factor do you think was intellectual property theft, or do you think that was just one of the factors and it has to do with the tariffs and how uncompetitive Chinese manufacturing is on a cost basis now? Uh, I think it's all of those factors. I think it also goes back to the THAAD issue that was in 20, I think, 15, 16, uh, with the, um, uh, where China locked out uh, Lotte because they owned the land that the THAAD uh, missiles were put on. Um, and I think a lot of the Korean companies realize that they're exposed and, um, and that they're overexposed to China. So, 
you know, and and uh, Samsung is a great example of a company that has looked at its supply chains, has realized that those skills reside elsewhere, and that they can de-risk their overall supply chains and their overall business by looking at other places. So, for example, that you know, the U.S. in 2018, for the first time in like I don't know, 20, 30 years, imported more TVs from Mexico than they did from China. And so, you know, those are pretty compelling um, uh, changes of direction uh, when we think about that. Uh, you know, China is this uh, TV manufacturing, you know, powerhouse, and Samsung makes a huge amount of TVs. And so when, when Americans are importing more TVs from Mexico than from China, um, China really needs to be careful. I've also heard a lot of anecdotal evidence from sources inside mainland China and business contacts that have traveled there sometimes three full months out of the year to negotiate with factory owners in Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and other cities in mainland China. And what I've heard over the last 12 months is that some of these factory owners, there's no demand for some of the products they're making and they're still keeping the workers employed. They're still manufacturing. They're piling up the inventory at some of them. And then I just heard a new story from a new contact in the last couple months at a, fact, a factory in Fujian. And they're known for making shoes, I guess, for Nike and other shoe companies. And what my contact told me, I didn't really believe them. It sounded like the Soviet Union was that they, t they produce one month on, one month off. So literally, I, I wasn't aware that factories could economically get away with this, where they could produce for one month, take a full month off, produce for one month and take a full month off. I just didn't believe it. And then I heard all these details and saw some pictures of it. Yeah, no, I mean, this is the analogy that I that I make with people. No, nobody really wants to compare China to the former Soviet Union. And of course, it's not the former Soviet Union, but... Um, production quotas and um, and supply side manufacturing plans are are you know the rule in China, especially for state owned entities. And so you know what you're talking about is normal. Um, it doesn't surprise people who have exposure to China um, because central planning is alive and well. And what we've been saying since February of 18, when the tariffs were first imposed, was that the biggest loser of the U.S.-China trade war would be Europe. Why? Because China will continue to manufacture at the levels it does because it has to keep people employed. That overproduction pushes deflation. And China doesn't want domestic deflation, so they do what they've been doing for 15 years, and they export deflation. Okay, and where does that go? Well, um, Japan's imports from China are down something like $20 billion a year, maybe a little bit more than that since 2012. Um, Europe's are up something like $60 billion a year since then. So, um, and, and if the U.S. has higher tariffs and is more guarded about Chinese imports, then um, they're going to, um, they're not going to be exporting as much to the U.S. So where does it go? goes to Europe because they have the income profile and they have the um, uh, the duty uh, regime to be able to accept that stuff. And that's a really dangerous environment for the European Manufacturing Center and potentially a hollowing out of the European Manufacturing Center. Yeah, so what we just talked about, Tony, it sounds very much like the manufacturers are being bailed out with economic central planning. And we talked about this, you talked about this before we started recording, that the Chinese government, the economic central planners, they, they are willing, more than willing, to just paper over their mistakes to keep people employed. And I think that's a theme with China that a lot of people that think the Chinese economy is doing well don't understand. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And, you know, just look at the equity market fallout in uh, in May of 2015 and how the government uh, went in to support that. I mean, the U.S. can't necessarily complain about that because that's what the U.S. did as well. Um, but, um, you know, with a centrally planned economy and a centrally planned manufacturing economy, you know, the, the big priority in China, as many people know, is social stability. Um, and, you know, they have to keep manufacturing things uh, so that they can keep people employed and they'll throw money at it 
uh, at industries and at companies to make sure that um, that people are employed. You can't have you know, um, you know, a billion DD drivers or Uber, Uber drivers in China. Um, you have to have them doing something else. Yeah, and in the newest interview, I don't know if you saw it with uh, Leland Miller from China Beige Book that was released for free on Real Vision TV recently. Mm -hmm. He was talking about how the Chinese let their official credit fall a lot, and then now it's back up to double-digit credit growth again. And he was talking about how a lot of this credit is going to manufacturers that it should not go to. Yes, it is. Uh, manufacturing has collapsed since, let's say, the second quarter of 2018. Um, and if Americans are only paying for 2% of those tariffs, then the other either 13 or 23% of those tariffs have to be paid by somebody. And that is um, the manufacturer, that's the exporter, who is likely getting a subsidy from, uh, from the government. And so maybe the exporter is, is eating part of it, but the government is eating a very, very large uh, part of that. And so um, there's a company called um, Apple Tree Capital uh, that does a calculation of the units of debt, units of credit required to produce one unit of GDP. Um, and uh, their latest calculation says that it takes seven and a half uh, renminbi of credit to produce one unit of our uh, one renminbi of GDP growth. So it's not a multiplier effect, it's actually a divisor effect uh, for credit expansion in China. It's so diluted um, that, um, that it's, it's seven and a half to one. Um, so they are awash with credit to bail out these companies and to bail out industries and keep people working. Do you also think because of how poorly some of these manufacturers are doing, but they have assets, so they can pledge these factories or other assets as collateral, and that's why Denny McMahon in his book, China's Great Wall of Debt, he documented this extensively. A lot of people in other businesses, factory owners or other businesses, they have no expertise in real estate, and yet they were borrowing enormous sums of money to go and start becoming real estate developers or betting on construction in condos or commercial in the last, I don't know, seven years, give or take. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, you know, quite realistic. I think um, uh, extending that debt and fueling the economy, it, it's not as if China is the only one doing this. We're in an era of that happening globally. Um, but the, the, the real question is, is there the productive base to be able to justify that borrowing against the future. And what we've been saying for um, quite some time is that, you know, the Asian century, as it's been called for, you know, 20 years, is effectively over because um, nearly all of Asia has borrowed against the next 30 years to fund the last 10 years. And so, you know, they've done it at an incredibly fast pace. And when you do that, it, things slow and and whether it's real estate or whether it's you know building out you know quote unquote key industries um, there has to be a time when things slow uh, if there is you know if there is economic management short of having some sort of devaluation what's your opinion on China's savings rate because the perception out there is that Chinese families have all of them have very high savings rate, what, 40% of their income they save. But if you look at the Chinese own, uh, their own data for household debt to GDP, it's up fivefold in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's now, I think, 50% of household debt to GDP. So it's increased massively in the last 10 years. And there's other stories like the Wall Street Journal running articles about younger adults my age, younger adults in mainland China who are up to their eyeballs in debt you know, buying things online and buying things in video games or computer games or sending gifts on live stream shows. So what, what's your opinion then on debt at the household family level in China then versus what the claim of the savings rate is? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, the data is out there and what you're saying is the, the data that's out there. And, you know, every, well, not every, most rapidly growing economies end up having a credit event. Um, 
And after that credit event, they move into a kind of a maturity phase. So, you know, look at Korea in the late 90s, you know, and so on. So it doesn't surprise me that China is in the situation that it's in, uh, in terms of credit, whether that's bank liabilities, whether that's, um, you know, government debt, whether that's household debt. Um, because they haven't felt the consequences of overextending themselves. Um, and there has to be some sort of credit event uh, for the government and for industry and households to really feel the accountability for overextending themselves. Now, of course, that will be shielded. Every company or every country shields their citizenry from credit events these days. And so it, the effects will be muted at the ground level, but they'll still be felt. So, you know, th that's, that's coming. Is it coming next year? I don't think so. Um, these things always last a bit longer than any forecaster ever thinks. So I want to tie this in with the currency because I was hearing from my sources in mainland China in July and August, they were starting to really worry about the Chinese yuan to dollar exchange rate. It was starting to get mm -hmm. out of control. Blue past, it blew past seven very, very quickly. But we're back down when we're recording this interview on Thursday, December 19th. The currency is back down to 7.010 Chinese yuan to the dollar. So the Chinese government has the currency. It looks like it's been under control now for over a month it's almost back down below seven. So it appears that they've temporarily gotten things under control. But eventually you would think with this, these credit problems, how quickly the credit is growing, the misallocation of capital, that there could be a currency problem in the years to come. Sure. So uh, our firm, Complete Intelligence, we actually forecast the CNY to weaken below seven uh, in July of 19. This was six months ahead of time. Um, we forecasted to cross 7 in July of 19. I think it happened in the first week of August. Um, so we've got a pretty good record around CNY. Um, it's hovering right around our forecast. We're 7.0109 uh, this month. We expect CNY to strengthen really through March, April. Um, it will peak in kind of February, March, we think. Um, and then the weakening trend begins, but it's gradual until about midsummer. Uh, and then we expect things to weaken um, notably uh, midsummer and kind of flatten out in Q3 and 4. So we will see a strengthening through, say, Q1 and into early Q2, uh, but then we see things start starting to weaken again. And whether that's on, you know, trade negotiations or whether that's, that's on, you know, fiscal activity in China. Um, there are a number of factors involved in that. Some of that is, is a seasonal factor around Chinese New Year. Um, but, um, uh, but we do expect, say, middle of 2020 to start to see notable weakening of the CNY again. Yeah, and the Chinese government has had to intervene a lot in the currency markets because they have mm -hmm. really bad problems with food prices, pork prices. So there was, I believe they banned the word stagflation in Mandarin on Chinese social media. <laughs> Things were getting that bad because of search. So there was, there is really bad stagflation there. Even the Chinese official data, the, the level of pork price increases is just, is just enormous. So it would make sense that they would try to control the currency and not let the currency get closer to eight Chinese yuan to the dollar and try to knock it back down, spend the resources necessary, at least calm things down for as long as they can. Yeah, that's right. Um, but I think that, you know, there are real problems around, um, you know, how much does it weaken? And if you look at uh, USDC and Y five years from now versus right now, you know, Michael Green uh, has talked for quite some time about the possibility of significant um, devaluation of CNY. Uh, and, um, and I don't think that's crazy. I think that is quite plausible given the state of the Chinese economy. Um, it's quite plausible that we see significant weakening of the CNY over the next, say, two, three, four years. Um, especially if things like, if there is a hardening of the trade talks, um, if there is a hardening of the U.S.-China trade uh, relationship, 
uh, then I think China has real problems if they have to find markets for their goods that are equivalent to the U.S. Now, nothing is going to be 100% washed out. But if they have to find markets for their goods, then they're going to have to find a way to be attractive uh, in many, many markets globally, and they're going to have to find ways to displace um, a lot of other manufacturing nations globally, and I'm not necessarily sure they can do that. So they're going to have to find ways um, really to, to weaken the currency to, um, uh, to achieve some of their aims. And Beijing was talking about rebalancing the economy so there was more consumption, but the average Chinese person, right, only has about $12,000 of income. I think that's what the amount that I've seen, and the average American makes, what, around forty or 42000 So, mm -hmm. yes, China's GDP looks very large, but when you actually look at how much income the average adult Chinese person is making relative to what the average adult American or adult European is making, the numbers are quite... They're, they're not, nowhere near in the same ballpark. No, you're absolutely right. And then this is where somebody starts talking about purchasing power parity, which I think is completely misguided, right? I mean, um, the fact is $12,000 is $12,000 and $45,000 is $45,000. Try to live in central Shanghai in $12,000. It's really, really hard. So, um, or Beijing or any major Chinese city. Um, it's very difficult to live on that um, and live what would be considered a, um, a reasonable life in a place like the U.S. Uh, so um, I think the consumption patterns in China have kind of uh, flattened out. And that's not, I mean, we need to keep in mind, this isn't just bad for China. This is bad for the world. We don't, nobody wants China to fail. Um, you know, we need to be really aware of the impact that this has primarily on the rest of Asia. So every single country in Asia, their largest trading partner is China. So if we see China slow and we see problems in the Chinese economy and we see consumption slow, then that hurts every country around China. And we don't want that. Um, uh, it also hurts uh, Europe as more, as I said, more devalued goods or more deflationary goods are going there, but it hurts the U.S. too because the U.S., the, you know, cannot isolate its own economic success. So, you know, there are limits. You know, the fact is with the trade discussion, China has circumvented WTO rules for decades. Um, that's not a mystery and it's not a surprise to anybody. And there is a point at which a country in its development has to start complying with those multilateral norms and international trading norms. And so China has to get its house in order in order to be able to, um, to conduct itself as the second most or second largest economy in the world. And we're at, we're in an interim phase right now where China is moving from a very large country that could kind of get away with things in terms of subsidies, non-tariff barriers, and so on and so forth, to one that is being forced to comply with international norms. And it's very painful. Uh, and the world has known that China has been getting away with things for a long time. Um, and, you know, accountability is tough, right? When you're competing on an equal basis, um, you have to work a lot harder and your gains are smaller. And I would also say that China has been the main economic growth engine coming out of the 2008 financial crisis with the amount of stimulus they put in relative to their GDP, the amount of central planning, the amount of commodities they use. The other people, the other group of entities that I think would be hurt immensely if China had more economic problems would be a lot of these emerging markets, especially ones that are focused on exporting mostly to China and also over leverage their economies to exporting commodities like base metals and energy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the Australians of the world, right? Um, the Brazils of the world, they'll, they'll hurt. Uh, so, but the fact is there is overcapacity in the steel sector. There is overcapacity in industrial metals. And so, um, you know, as China slows and as they have um, uh, fewer trade finance facilities to be able to buy that stuff, 
um, I think it, it hurts those countries, and I think it's, it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, but again, th this isn't something we see happening in Q1 of 2020. This is something that's iterative, first of all. And second of all, nobody wants this to happen um, because a lot of people have benefited from China's growth. And um, I think a lot of people work very hard to slow the negative impact um, of China's economic slowdown. So I want to talk about, get your thoughts on this trade deal. So Trump mm -hmm. has said now in the last couple months, there was phase one was supposed to be complete in October. And mm -hmm. within, what, 48 hours, that was dead. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. over the weekend, right? The Chinese were already walking it back. They were noncommittal. They don't want to sign anything enforceable. And Trump announced what phase one was complete again just in the last week. And here we go again that China doesn't want to commit to a number. They were talking about do, um, making the purchases two years from now. So what's your view on this? Has there actually been any trade deal progress since May? Because as far as I can tell, and I get information secondhand from Kyle Bass, from, M from our mutual friend Emma Mullman, and other sources, because I'm right outside of Washington, D.C., that there really hasn't been a lot of progress on trade deal negotiations because China doesn't really want to compromise because that would show weakness, and the U.S. doesn't want to give in China has some really interesting demands. A lot of them center around Huawei, in my, uh, from what I've heard. Mm. Yeah, I, so I don't have any, uh, any special insight into what's happening within USTR or the White House. So, um, you know, I'm purely talking about my uh, observations uh, more than anything. But, you know, observationally, I, I think they came to an in-principle agreement uh, at the top level, um, and maybe uh, with some level of detail, um, but I'm not necessarily sure uh, they came to uh, what I would what I would call a firm final phase one agreement. Um, and so, you know, after Trump was elected, um, I was asked to brief uh, the NDRC. Uh, and the largest uh, international think tank in China called CCIE. And so um, uh, I was telling them that this was coming, the trade war was coming, and they didn't believe it. And I, I told them, look, you don't understand what's happening on the ground in the U.S. You don't understand um, the perspective of Trump and of the industrial base in the U.S. Um, I said, you have to be prepared for this. And um, their response was, why is he picking on us? Okay. They said, um, uh, Japan subsidizes, Germany subsidizes, Korea subsidizes. You know, they named all of these countries that have effectively the same practices that China has. Um, so I don't necessarily believe that um, China is afraid of looking weak. I believe that there's a sincere misunderstanding that they're actually a problem. Um, and so there is, I don't believe there's a recognition that what they're doing is unique. And uh, I believe there's, um, there's a conviction in China that everyone does what they've been doing. So what they're doing is not abnormal. Um, and maybe uh, they think that they're getting kind of, uh, that, that they're being made to uh, take extraordinary measures uh, and be compliant in a way that other people aren't compliant. So I don't necessarily think it's about looking weak or looking strong in China, although that's a lot of the kind of what I think is fairly amateur analysis that's out there. I think it's more about coming to terms with the expectations on China as a um, bona fide, good faith um, international player. Um, and so what we're seeing uh, develop as these trade deals come closer and closer is, um, uh, is a realization uh, inside of the government. Because within the Chinese bureaucracy, there is a, a very deep-seated fear to pass negative information upward. Um, and I think the... Um, the leadership is not hearing the real story on the ground. 
Uh, and so this is not what you hear on your, you know, Western news network because they don't have visibility into what happens within uh, the bureaucratic system. But bad news, real news, real perspectives are not pushed up within the Chinese bureaucracy um, because people are afraid for their families, their lives, their positions, their incomes, everything. Um, and so I think these negotiators are learning things while they're at the table. They're very smart people. I'm not saying they don't have the capacity to understand, um, but they're so busy with everything that they're doing, I don't think they're getting a true reflection of what's actually happening on the ground. That's very interesting. And to add to your points there, Denny McMahon talked about this in his book, how the local politicians, they created these local government financing vehicles, and they didn't want to pass bad news up the chain, like you said, to Beijing or their bosses, these local mayors or local government officials. So they just flubbed on the GDP data. They uh, inflated it they to a lot higher. And then they yep. created these dummy companies, these local government financing vehicles, and the local banks let them borrow, uh, let these local dummy companies borrow lots of money expecting to get bailed out from the main government in Beijing. And it, it has not worked out that way exactly. Of course, that's, that's absolutely right. And that's, you know, in a very general top level sense, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and the reason that's happening now is because credit is tighter um, and the ability to lend is tighter and the kind of Wild West um, environment that we had through, say, 2008 is, uh, well, or say 2011 or so, just isn't there anymore. And so, you know, I think many people in the West still have a perception of China like it's 2000. 10 or 11, when you had, you know, crazy economic growth rates, um, you had massive credit expansion, massive monetary policy expansion, um, and you had, you know, a, a lot of really interesting things happening in the major cities in China, but that's changed really fast. Yeah, I totally agree. I think things have changed a lot. I was actually bullish on China in 2008, 9, 10, 11, with all their mm -hmm. spending on commodities, I bought a lot of copper miners when they were close to bankruptcy because I was seeing all the Chinese stimulus plans, but I was looking at, they were pulling so many decades worth of demand for steel, iron ore, concrete, copper forward, that it just wasn't sustainable that they were going to be able to pull that many decades of demand forward in only about a 15 year span. Yep, that's right. Um, and I think it's, again, it was, it's been an abrupt stop um, and that is, you know, nobody ever plans on, on those types of abrupt stops. It doesn't really fit into the model. So you worked with a lot of Chinese bureaucrats in mainland China. What was your sense of how efficient they are? Because a lot of Westerners think that China is running their government, their economy a lot more efficient than the U.S. No, it's, it's terribly inefficient. Um, you know, there's this there's a perception that, um, you know, the Chinese government is this all seeing, all knowing, you know, fabulous planner that, um, you know, plans in hundred year cycles. And, you know, it's uh, it's a terrible cultural stereotype um, that many Westerners have allowed themselves to be sucked into. Um, and um, first of all, they're human beings like everyone else. Second of all, they're bureaucrats like everyone else. And third of all, they're in a very corrupt country. So, you know, there are a lot of strange incentives in terms of how uh, and when uh, they work and what they do. So, again, these are very, very smart people. Um, and they're not lazy people at all, but they understand how to game the system for their own benefit. It may be a communist system in name, it may be a communist system, um, uh, a communist government, um, but you know, the workers are going to do whatever they can to optimize their own position um, and keep their heads down. You know, nobody really wants to be 
um, uh, to be all that notable within the bureaucracy. Of course, there are those elite families and those elite performers um, who are raised up early on, but for the most part, people want to kind of keep their head down and, and do what they can to game the system, and that happens in every bureaucracy. Yeah, I mean, I've just seen some of the stories lately. I don't know if you saw it over the summer, but there was a local Chinese politician, and he was he had multiple secret vaults underneath his uh, mansion, oh, yeah. and he had, what, 13 tons of physical gold, over $500 million, yeah. and then he had another secret vault next to it with $42 billion worth of printed Chinese yuan. I was in shock at uh, how much yeah. he had accumulated, and now he couldn't get that wealth out of the country. It's unbelievable, and it's not rare. Um, and um, and this stuff, I think, um, I, I don't think we've seen the last of it, of course, but um, but uh, it really shows you how some of these local governments are run. Is it fair to say that a lot of these real estate bubbles in Vancouver, Australia, Orange County, California, um, elsewhere, has been Chinese money that has been either stolen or laundered out of mainland China and used to buy a lot of different properties in different countries? Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. I mean, I, I would have to look, you know, deep into the detail, but, you know, uh, from a top level, it seems like that would be fair to say because, um, you know, the capital was, you know, pretty easy to move for years, and it was in the interests of the people in charge to allow that capital to be easy to move. The window is pretty much closed now. Uh, so it's very difficult um, uh, to do what was done previously uh, unless you're from a very, very small group of people. So um, anyway, so, so I think, uh, you know, the, the capital controls um, have really changed um, many, many, uh, the ability of many, many of these wealthy Chinese individuals. And I would say, moderately connected, but not extremely well-connected people to get money out of the country. Yeah, they've, they've just been layering on newer and newer capital controls. I mean, China, I would call it more voluntary, voluntarily based cashless society because a lot of Chinese use smartphones now with QR codes mm -hmm. to pay for things, right? Cash is not used as frequently. So this is not the government saying immediately that they have to go to cashless society, although the Chinese government is talking about a crypto yuan. But the market voted and said they want convenience, people want to pay on their smartphones, and a lot of things are paid for without cash and with QR codes. Yeah, well, there's no illusion in China that anybody has privacy. So, um, you know, uh, paying for everything electronically, paying for everything on your, through your social media account or something, um, is just normal because there there was never really an expectation of privacy uh, around your personal activity. So um, it's not really that surprising to me that this stuff has taken off. And you know, when I'm there and I'm sitting in a restaurant, I'm the only one paying cash, uh, and I do that partly just for the novelty of it. <laughs> because because I'm different, right? And uh, and I think it's interesting. But everyone pays with QR codes. Do you think that uh, crypto yuan, do you think this is a more a larger method of control then? So China can, any rabble rouser, anyone who puts anything bad on social media can immediately be removed from the system. Uh, China can track more purchases almost in real time with a centralized database. So what do you think the goal is then with China? They haven't officially, they've been talking about crypto yuan, they haven't officially launched it, launched it yet, but it seems that it's, it's inevitable and coming soon. Um, you know, I, the problem with, and I'm not a blockchain expert and I'm not a cryptocurrency expert, but um, I'm not sure that the Chinese Central Bank has the discipline to keep the integrity of that cryptocurrency. Um, you know, there, there is only value if it has integrity. Um, you know, if it is somehow that integrity is somehow disturbed, um, I think that they, um, that they lose it. So um, I think it's more about control, as you say, um, you know, taking, you know, uh, actors that they want out, um, disciplining people, controlling people, and also 
uh, as you say, having a, a real-time view on how money is flowing. Um, and so imagine if you can understand your, you know, your um, industrial production or your GDP or your consumer spending on a minutely or hourly basis or daily basis. Um, I don't know that they really want that. I think they'd be surprised by that. Um, but, um, but I think it's, it's a really interesting concept. But like, a, uh, like you said, it, I think it's, it's probably more about individual control, like the social credit system and all this other stuff, than it is about uh, uh, reporting information uh, truthfully. Because government statistics agencies are incentivized to report good information. They're not necessarily incentivized to report true information. Yeah, there's a problem globally with all this government economic data. I think it's very heavily mm -hmm. flawed or outright lying in a lot of cases. But you talked about maintaining integrity with a crypto yuan. Do you mean like keeping the supply of, of crypto yuan down where, uh, for example, the People's Bank of China could decide, oh, hey, we're going to install this backdoor code and we're going to secretly allow all these extra crypto yuans that – crypto yuan that most people don't know about and we're going to increase the supply massively because we don't even have to print the yuan anymore. Yes, it's exactly that. And, um, you know, if the supply is reported at X, but it's really X plus, you know, Y. Um, and, you know, if, if nobody knows about that, that's fine. Uh, but if that becomes known, uh, then the you know the perception of the va of value there is problematic, and you can say, well, that happens with fiat currencies. Yep, it does. Um, but most central banks are pretty good at reporting that stuff. Um, but if you're hiding information, which wouldn't surprise me, um, because the you know Chinese authorities do that on a regular basis, and again, I'll say they're not unique in doing that. But launching a cryptocurrency requires, um, you know, requires it to be fixed, requires the supply to be fixed. I want to thank you for your time today, Tony. I've really learned a lot with this discussion. I think my listeners will love it. They'll learn a lot as well. My, if my listeners want to follow you on Twitter and learn more about your company and what you do, how do they do so? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Tony Nash on Asia. And you can also find me at my company, completeintel.com. And what does your company do with artificial intelligence, if my listeners are curious? Sure. We uh, have built an artificial intelligence platform that helps companies uh, forecast their revenues and their costs. We do that on a bill of material and an element basis, very granular basis, by integrating with their ERP and CRM and other systems uh, so they can plan their business in perfect context to all the transactions that they're doing. Uh, we help them do that on a monthly interval basis over one to two years so that you can plan, you know, product A, let's say it's uh, the costs are 7% over budget in April of 2020. You can take uh, actions to negotiate with your vendors or substitute out process uh, uh, elements or look at other products, that sort of thing. So we're doing very granular uh, cost planning uh, and very granular revenue planning for clients, uh, as well as forecasting every currency, most commodities, almost every equity index, uh, trade and economics uh, globally. Wow. Uh, the the integration the excuse me the technological advancements and improvements in supply chain management software has improved a lot in the last 20 years. I remember hearing stories of old supply chain management where like the the middle level manager would have to make a bunch of phone calls to get some numbers that would take him a week or more, and now that can basically be done instantaneously right through uh, no, an crazy. iPad. So, you know, I my first job. Um, in supply chain, <clears throat> pardon me, I was a third-party vendor uh, within a clothing manufacturer in San Francisco, um, and they were keeping their global supply chain data on three-by-five index cards. Um, this was in 1994, so it was a while ago, but it wasn't, you know, the 1950s. Um, what we then developed, <clears throat> pardon me, I mean, there was track and trace software, that sort of thing, and 
you know, I remember in the mid 90s going into, you know, Eastern Europe, parts of Asia, Northern Africa to teach people how to use barcode scanners so you could track at the box level. Um, and then came RFID so you could track at the item level and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Pardon me. But what's really happened, say, over the last five years are things like, um, uh, you know, planning activities and the granularity of planning activities because um, forecasting is a terrible discipline. Um, what we find is procurement teams regularly have error rates for their costs of 30% or more. Okay, that's three zero percent or more. It's very difficult. Industry expert forecasters typically have an error rate of 20% or more. So these industry firms that forecast the oil price, the gold price, or the corn price or whatever, their error rates are typically 20% or more. Um, and it's largely because these forecasts are gamed to some sort of consensus. Um, they're done in very basic Excel models, um, and their forecast uh, approaches haven't changed for five or ten or more years. So <clears throat> what we have is a reinforcement learning engine that optimizes, you know, we're running billions of calculations for every data series every month to understand uh, what really impacts the price of tr or, or the, the movement of transactions in the global economy. So it's not possible for a human being and it's not possible for Excel to run this many calculations. But when you have, let's say you run a global food company and you have 200 products and you have, you know, uh, thousands of items that go into those products, including packaging, um, it's not possible for your entire planning team uh, to understand where those costs are going on a monthly interval basis over the next year or two years. That's the kind of stuff that we do. So it's big math, it's big statistics, it's big um, kind of coding uh, to make sure that we can track that, track our error, and help clients understand where their spend is going. Um, and this is really, so, you know, if we go from, say, track and trace software 25 years ago to very uh, specific cost planning today, um, the supply chain, you know, automation of supply chains have changed dramatically over the last 25 years. Wow. That was great. That was an added bonus there for our listeners about supply chain management right there. So. If, as an entrepreneur then, Tony, if you can solve a problem like that and you can fix those inefficiencies of 30% or more, you can develop a good business if you can solve someone else's problem like that. If you can oh, yeah. help them. In so so the, the really interesting part that we have is our entire process is automated. So we run one script and the entire global economy and all the elements in it uh, are calculated. And those algorithms evolve as the world economy changes. Um, and so we've taken human error or are working very hard at taking uh, human error out of that entire process. Uh, and so, you know, this, when it comes to looking at, you know, let's say government statistics or costs or industry performance, you know, these sorts of things, as we automate the calculation of these things, it reduces the error, <clears throat> pardon me, it reduces the error from, um, you know, that outlook. And like I said, forecasting itself it has been, has become an incredibly flawed discipline. And so we're trying very hard to remedy that. Oh, yeah. The, the regular mainstream economists, these PhD economists, yeah, almost all their predictions are wrong. Modeling, yep. modeling a complex global economy, just look at their predictions. Their track records are way off. No, it's awful. And there's no accountability. And so we calculate our error rates for everything that we forecast. And we're transparent with our clients about that. So I would challenge any of your listeners, if they're buying external forecasts, they need to demand that their service provider gives them 12-month error rates for everything that they buy. And if they don't do that, then they shouldn't be trusted. Excellent. Well, thank you again for your time, Tony. Really appreciate it been very generous Thanks, with your time over an hour. Thank you, Jason. Thanks very much.